Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Square Wave 2. I usually have a vintage shortwave receiver to show you, something we call boat anchors, but I don't have one today. Instead I'd like to show you a little project I put together just for the fun of it. It is the great great granddaddy to every radio receiver past, present, and future. And here it is the famous Crystal Radio AM receiver. This was absolutely state-of-the-art in 1920. It was just as remarkable to people in those days as the moon landing was to people in 1969. I think everyone knows that these radios operate without any visible means of support, without any visible power supply. There are no batteries, no line cord to plug into the wall. These little radios indeed work for free, and I think that's probably why they're so fascinating to many hobbyists today. Many people are building these radios. Just look at the videos on YouTube. Well, I'm going to begin by showing you my front panel and explaining the controls, what they do. My radio has three controls, main tuning, ground tuning, which is used to raise the set above ground potential, and a band switch. But this is not really a band switch. It's just a rotary switch with nine positions to select different taps on a single 80 turn broadcast band coil. I built this set with the same care I take building a vacuum tube receiver. First is mechanical stability. Everything is firmly mounted to a half inch plywood base. Nothing is temporary. Nothing wiggles or can move. All leads are as short as possible, and all connections are properly soldered. No cold solder joints. This way I will be sure to get all the performance this circuit can deliver. Here is the 80 turn coil wound on a mailing tube two inches in diameter and coated with varnish. No, I never use bathroom artifacts in my radios. The taps are loops connected to nine points on the rotary switch. They let you make the coil longer or shorter according to what part of the broadcast band you want to tune. Here are two 365 picofarad tuning capacitors I got from tubesandmore.com, antique electronics. Cost, very reasonable, $13 each. Here are my headphone connections and here are the antenna and ground connections. Here is the very heart of a crystal radio, the crystal. But nowadays, the piece of galena ore once used in these radios is replaced by a modern germanium diode, and that's what you see here in my radio. This diode does the job much better, much more efficiently. Let me show you the crystal you had to deal with in the 1920s. Here is a facsimile of the cat whisker crystal used in the first crystal radios. What you see down here are just terminals to connect the crystal to the rest of your circuit. But up here is the Galena crystal, crystal ore. There's a little piece of wire here, a probe, that's called a cat whisker. And the cat whisker is attached to a movable arm. Now the purpose of the crystal and the crystal radio is to conduct current in one direction only, so the circuit has to be closed. In other words, the cat whisker has to contact the crystal. Now, sure enough, there's a problem with this. Not all spots on the crystal will work. A lot of them are simply dead. So what the operator has to do is search around with his cat whisker, moving the probe until he finds a spot that works. And then, of course, if you jar your radio, you lose your spot and have to start all over again. I used this very crystal setup in the radio I showed you before just as an experiment, and I found it very tedious and very clumsy. So I went back to what we have here, the modern solution, the germanium diode. All you do is install it and forget it. If you would like to learn more about the crystal radio and the function of the crystal, or build your own crystal radio, I have a recommendation for you. Here is a great little book. And here it is, folks. Radios That Work For Free 
by K. E. Edwards. This little book was published in 1977 by Hope and Allen. It's an excellent book for the beginner wanting to get into building crystal radios. This is really a great little book. It has 20 chapters. Chapter 1 is called How They Work. Mr. Edwards explains basic radio theory with emphasis on the crystal radio receiver in a simple, clear way that's easy for anybody to understand. Chapter 2 is parts, where he talks about all the parts necessary to build your crystal radio and where you can find them. And a lot of them can be salvaged from old tube televisions or tube radios. Uh, the next chapter is antenna and ground, detectors, phones. Then he goes through a series of chapters, each one describing a specific part from your radio. Coils, capacitors, switches. So you have a good understanding of each part, what it looks like and what it does. Chapter 13 is tools, where he even describes the basic hand tools necessary to build your crystal radio. Now in this book, there are three projects you can build, three crystal radios. The first one is a simple, basic crystal radio you might want to start with. The second one is a more complicated crystal radio, and this is the one I chose to build. This one is complicated by the fact that you have to wind a special coil with looped taps. I'll get into that in a minute. The third project, believe it or not, is a short wave crystal radio. Now I have copied the diagram from page 100 showing the radio I built, and I'd like to let you see it now. Okay, so the circuit itself is not that complicated, but you have to wind a special coil with looped taps. And here's another one I wound. This has 80 turns on a 2-inch mailing tube, and it has a series of taps, which are actually loops. These taps have to be made as you wind the coil, which is kind of tricky. It can be difficult, it can be hair-raising, it can be very disappointing if you don't know what you're doing. Now, I have developed my own special system for winding a coil and making the taps. I'm going to show this to you in a future video. Now, unfortunately, this book may be out of print now. I'm sure it is. It was first printed in 77. But it does show up on eBay occasionally. And if you see it, please go ahead and get it. It's worth the effort. Mr. Edwards is so considerate. He has even provided in the back of the book some dial scales you can cut out and paste on your own radio. Pretty neat. I will just bet that somebody is waiting for a demonstration and I won't let you down. Now I realize that no one is wearing headphones so I have enlisted the help of my trusty Heathkit signal tracer IT12. I built this particular unit myself in 1960 and it served me well for many years. It's going to act as an audio amplifier for the crystal receiver. And the crystal receiver is hooked up to my long wire antenna on the roof and to a good cold water pipe ground. Now, of course, reception is better in the evening hours or at night. And here it's noon. But let's see what we can tune in. Now you're digesting the way you did when you were 20. And 
slowly, you should see the blah, blah, blah. And then it goes to the game, and, you know, you can actually hear the offensive coordinator, Joe Moorhead, saying, hey, guys, remember where we were a year ago? Now that she's on the other foot, and we want to put as many points up on them and make it as bad as a loss as it was for us a year ago. So to say that, Tennessee obviously doesn't remember. Well, that's it, folks. Pretty darn good. Three loud, clear stations with good separation. And you heard them first here on Square Wave 2. The next thing I'd like to talk about is what you're going to use to listen to your crystal receiver. It's not going to be any kind of a speaker, I can tell you that. Remember, the crystal radio has absolutely no amplification. What you hear is just what is coming through the ether from the transmitting antenna. Now, a lot of people use these little crystal earplugs to listen to their radios, and they work pretty well, and they're very inexpensive. But to listen to your radio the authentic way people did in the 1920s, you will need a pair of high impedance, high quality, vintage headphones, something like I have here. These phones were probably made around 1920 by the Brandes Company, B-R-A-N-D-E-S. They are high impedance, very high quality, do an excellent job of reproducing what your crystal radio set is receiving. These are getting rare and kind of expensive, but if you find a pair, go ahead and snap them up. It'll be worth the expense. The last very important issue I want to cover is your antenna. All crystal radio sets need a good antenna. My antenna is just a piece of wire about 50 feet long strung up on my roof between two poles. And even with that minimal antenna, my crystal set can receive three stations clearly during the daytime and a couple more at night. Of course, the ideal antenna for a crystal radio would be a long wire antenna, 100 feet long or longer, and raised up on poles as high in the air as you can get it. Now the ground connection, which is required by crystal radios, is a lot easier. You take a wire and run it from your radio to the nearest cold water pipe and you have an adequate ground. And remember, crystal radio building is a fun and perfectly safe hobby for kids of all ages. Well, good luck in building your first crystal radio set. I know you will enjoy it. That's all for the radio that works for free. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again next time. But if you really want to listen to your crystal radio in the authentic way people did in the 1920s, you will need a pair of high-quality, vintage, high-impedance headphones. Something like I have here. Now you have to excuse me for a minute. My cat is playing with my crystal earphone. He thinks it's a toy. Dylan, let go. Let go.